Um, so our first speaker today um, is our uh, is as I said one of our very own postdocs, Dr. Zhang Nan Wang. Um, he joined us last year as a uh, postdoc affiliate and uh, very uh, proud to announce that he was the he was one of three in the first cohort of male postdocs in our Lucy Cavendish College, which is uh, which is absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully not has not been too intimidating an experience for you. <laughs> Um, before that, he was an affiliate with uh, Trinity Hall, and uh, we are very fortunate that he um, has, has joined us as a member of the um, Lucy Cavendish community last year. Um, however, he will not be long uh, with us as a postdoc affiliate, but rather will be moving on into the alumnus sort of uh, category because he's recently accepted a position at Birmingham, a more uh, permanent position, and congratulations to you on that. Um, so I'm glad we got him to talk to us before he uh, leaves. Um, uh, but with that, uh, I'd just like to highlight that he uh, he received his uh, PhD, which was at least a part of it was uh, was a joint PhD with the University of Cambridge. Um, he received his PhD from the uh, Tsinghua University at uh, in Beijing in uh, thermal engineering, and that was back in 2014. Since then, he's been, um, he's been uh, involved in different uh, projects um, with, uh, with the commercial aircraft en engine company in Shanghai, China, and also with uh, Rolls-Royce. And uh, since 2019 or so, he's been um, um, affiliated with the uh, Department of Engineering at the Cambridge University. And uh, most of what he has been doing ha um, is to do with uh, with the um, with the acoustics and uh, uh, turbulence in um, in. Uh, forgive me if I get this wrong, uh, but essentially in um, aeroacoustics and uh, uh, fluid dynamics. Right. This yeah, takes yeah. me back to <laughs> my basics of engineering. So you must forgive me. Um, but anyway, uh, without much further ado, I'm going to let Zhang Nan uh, take the stage and tell us a little bit about what he's been doing here um, at the Department of Engineering. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, I can just share my screen. So, okay. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, I I joined college last year, and uh, I'm very honored to be accepted as a male fellows, and I feel really enjoyable during this time. No matter have the seminars in the uh, college or have some dinners in the college, it, I feel really a welcoming environment and really enjoy it. And today I will give some. Uh, give a talk on my research. And uh, I try to make it as interesting as possible. And I don't want to destroy the environment, which later on Mary will put to us is a poetry. So I want, so that's why I start with a poem in the fluid dynamics in my field. So this poem uh, was written by a British physicist, Louis Richard, Richardson. So it reads like this. Big walls have little walls that fit on their velocity. And the little walls have lesser walls and so on to viscosity. So it basically explains some behaviors in fluid. So the big vertices will break up into small vertices. And the small vertices will finally dissipate by the viscosity into heat. And there's a well known theory now in turbulence called turbulence cascade. So, the topic today I will talk about is the re relationship between the computers and the fluids. So, as introduced by the, by the host, I'm Jungnan Wang, and from the Department of Engineering. And I'm a postdoc fellows in the Lucy Cavendish. And 
what I will talk today. So first, when you think of the two words, computer and fluids, probably the first uh, or the worst scenario comes into your mind probably is uh, you have a cup of coffee and uh, some accident happens and the coffee will pour onto the computers. It's really a disaster. I don't really want to talk about that. So what I really want to talk about is the how to use the supercomputers to, to solve the engineering fluid problem, such as the flows around a car or over an aircraft. To be specific, I want to talk about the aircraft noise, which is the noise generated by the flow around the aircraft. So the simulation I run is on these aircrafts, but why matter we study the noise? So one example here is the Heathrow third runway. It never happens because of the aircraft noise, uh, because you know many office was built near the Heathrow. When the aircraft take off or landing, it, it always introduces a huge amount of noise, which is very annoying to the people. So my work is to use the computer to simulate the flows coming out of the engine and especially the noise coming out of these flows. So before to to reducing this flow or understanding these flows, we want to understand the why and the what the noise comes from when the aircraft take off or landing. So on the left hand side, there's a figure which showing the noise source distribution in an aircraft when it takes off. So from the light figures, can you see the cursor? So if you can see the cursor, they the aircraft noise may come from the undercarriage of the aircraft and the wind of the aircraft and also the engine of the aircraft. The majority of noise actually generated by the engine. So in the engine, the outstanding component of this noise is the noise coming from the exhaust of the engine. So which was showing on the bottom right figures. Uh, the bottom right figure shows the flows coming from the engine, back of the engine, and the color is, is the velocity contour plot on the ISO surface of vorticity. And you can see these flows coming from the engines, which interact with the wind. And the background, the black and the white contour showing the sound emitted from the engine, the ripples is the sound wave. So you can see two sources from the engine under the wind. One is the noise from the jet itself, and the one is the interact with the, with the wind, it just generates some actual sounds. So to, to reduce this noise, current we have some method to reduce that one is the passive control of the noise which we shape the nozzles at the back of the engine the nozzle exit and uh, that's kind of alter the flow structures and control the sound and another way to control the sounds to use some active control which illustrates on the right figure which is the aerial engine nozzle there there are many small rods uh, insert into the engine axis, which will inject the micro fluid particles into the engine, which try to reduce the noise. So actually in these two categories of noise reducing method, none of them is optimized and none of them can be prom uh, can be guaranteed to reduce the noise at its full potential. So the reason why we can't do it for the moment is we don't understand what kind of flow structure actually generates noise and how to control its noise generation process accurately. So my research is one to figure out which components of the fluid generating noise and how to control that effectively. So 
back to the topic of the fluid and the computers. So we want to use computer to simulate fluid. So first we want, to, we want the computer to understand fluid. So how to describe the fluid to a computer and make it understand it. So we need to convert the fluid behavior and de describe that into some mathematical formula. The basic physical principle we use to describe this is the conservation laws. We all know in our daily life whether you are aware of or not. One is the mass conservation law, which means the flow particle when it travels, the mass is conserved. It will not gain mass or lose mass. And another conservation law is the momentum conservation. So in other words, it's the Newton's second law is the force equals to the mass times the acceleration, which is the high school physics tells us. And the final one is the energy conservation of the fluid particles. The energy is conserved. The, the energy only changes because of the heat transfer or the friction heat or volume, volume metric heat source exists in the fluid, such as a chemical reaction. So all the system of equations, we call it Navier-Stokes equation, which is first pro promoted, uh, proposed by Navier and Stokes in 1920s. So actually Stokes was in Cambridge when he proposed this theory. He was a fellow of Pembroke College. And next step actually is to how to solve these equations in the supercomputer. So in the simulation, we have three steps. First, we pre-processing the geometry, like the aircraft geometry, and make it accessible to the computer or supercomputer. And then we discretize the fluid domain and uh, calculate the, the fluid, uh, fluid equations on every uh, part of the fluid domain. And finally, we assemble the fluid uh, the solutions and analyze it. So the, the code part, the simulation part, we parallelize this in the supercomputer. The parallelization, what I mean is to let thousands of calls calculate together. They collaborate together to calculate the flow field. Uh, each of them calculates a different part of the fluid. And then finally, it assembles the result into a whole uh, solution and uh, present to us. And uh, actually, to be specific, specific, we have two solvers in the process. One is the flow solvers. We solve the flows from the engine, and we solve the flow behavior. We think that is the sun source. And the second step, we have acoustic solver, which is on top of the flow solver. We propagate the sun from the sun source to the far field. Uh, so that we can evaluate the sound emitted from this flow. So the impact of building up this methodology to simulate flow is to replace the rig test in the physical world and to test that numerically in the supercomputer instead of building the real test grid and test it. And this work has been done in a European project back to uh, 2019, and we finished, just, just last year, we finished this project. So basically the project uh, is split into two parts. We have an experiment campaign, and the way this day, and the first part, what I, what I did is to do the simulation. So actually the simulation is, was done before the experiment, and the right figure showing the simulation results with the experiment, the red line, is the simulation result and the dotted point is the, 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 the experiment result. And finally, you see the match with experiment is really well, which kind of verify the simulation is capable of capture, capturing the physical process to give the far field prediction. 
What's more than that is the simulation can give the detail of the flow field, which, which we can understand the process of noise generation. And as illustrated here, we have the jet noise cell from the jets. And we have another two source cause the insulation. One is the leading edge scattering of the acoustic. And the other is the insulation noise because of the jet interact with the wind and generate some actual source of noise. And based on these understandings in the projects, we design a new nozzle, which is showing here. You can see the solutions uh, at the exit of the nozzle, which breaks down the turbine structure, which is the flow structure into very small, tiny uh, vertices, and which is able to mixing out the jet quickly before it's reaching the trailing edge of the wind and reduce that interaction. And as a result, you can see the right figure, the blue line, and compared to the right line, it reduced the noise almost 8 dBs at the mid frequency of this, this air engine. And uh, after that, we compare this simulation with the rig test. So in terms of the turn run time and the cost. So if you see the turn run time, the physical test takes about two months. If everything goes very smoothly, and it's very optimistic. And if we're using the simulation, we can have the time. So we take one month to, to do the whole simulation and the analysis. More advantage will show in the cost. If for a physical rig test, it's extremely expensive. Just for one test point, it needs 200,000 pounds to, to, <clears throat> to, only, to, to only obtain a few dotted point. But for the CFD, which is a numerical simulation, it takes only one quarter of that cost back in 2018. If you predict the cost in the future, the cost of simulation will reduce further. And in 2025, it will reduce to almost one twentieth of the cost of the physical test. So what I I'm trying to show is the, the advantage of the numerical stimulation is very cost effective in the long run. And that is one possible reason to reduce the rig test the, the, the future, at least reduce the number of tests in the future to replace part of them. The other impact the numerical simulation give us is the massive amount of data in the flow field. Because in the experiment, we can't measure that details. And the measurement error is usually very large. So the, uh, the, the numerical simulation can provide a great details of the flow field, which enable us to for the noise generation mechanism. Uh, the figure showing here on the left hand side is the simulation of this jet noise. And the two nozzle geometry are compared to one nozzle and one is the no. This difference of the flow structure gives the reduction of the and shaping the nozzle and the control the noise generation process and reduce or suppress the noise generation process for noise reduction. And by using these simulations, we can develop some data-driven method to detect the element of the fluid inside this jet flow which generates noise and which paves the way to control it in the future. Therefore the future impact of this research is try to optimize the nozzle shape to suppress the noise generation process for noise reduction. So the research 
question we want to address is have two folds. One is how the noise source responds to the nodal change. And the second is what is the full potential of noise reduction by shaping the nodal. So by defining the power sound levels at a far field observer, which means if you sit in the observer in the far field and you hear the sound, the sound level you hear is the object function. By doing a sensitivity analysis to the near field, we, we are able to identify the structure actually generating this sound. And uh, on top of that, we are doing another layer of sensitivity analysis to the sense to to the nozzle, which means the how the nozzle change this noise generation structure. By using this sensitivity information, we can optimize the nozzle shape, which control the noise generation process, which in the street is below. If you compare these two animation, you can see visually see the sound generated by the flow structure have been suppressed. And by doing this, we will be able to achieve a maximum noise reduction by controlling the noise generation process and then lead to a new generation of methods in the frame of high static simulation to reduce noise and accelerate the low noise aircraft design. So finally, to summarize, so uh, I, today the talk I show in is mainly uh, application of using the supercomputers to solve a large scale engineering flow fluid problem. And the, the method I develop is to use the supercomputer and build up a high static simulation method framework to address a industry level complex geometry uh, fluid problem of the jet noise, which is related to the aircraft. And this simulation can provide the accurate and the cost-effective solution and can reduce the noise and provide the insight into this gen noise generation process. So in the future, it can potentially replace parts of the physical rig test and also can be used to accelerate the design by using some optimization methods. So that's all from my talk, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Zhongnan. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, any questions? We now have the, um, um, the session open for questions. Um, if you'd like to ask him a question, please uh, let me remind you to post it in the, um, the chat window and I will unmute you so that you can, um, so that you can ask your question. Uh, sorry, just give me a second. Uh, okay, um, so while we're waiting, um, if you don't mind my uh, just getting the session quick uh, kick started. Um, so is this, uh, so your future research when you go into your next position, will that, um, will, is that uh, uh, based on further simulations of, uh, um, of, I mean, basically using supercomputers to uh, model other sort of fluid dynamic behaviors, or are you looking to branch into something else mm -hmm. at all? Uh, I think I mainly say probably I what I want to look at is still related to it and use computer to simulate. Ah, I see. Yeah. So um I think the I think in the near term I probably continue the aerocusic research by using computer. Um mm -hmm. in in this field specifically um, when the computer is uh, is available is just recent years and it's opened up a new horizon for this field mm -hmm. to actually look at into the details of the structures of the fluid which generates right. noise. So I think that that 
probably can 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 make me to survive a few years, <laughs> five or ten years, like to explore these fields. But <clears throat> but in the long run, I think combining the fluids and the, the computer is probably <clears throat> is my main interest to try to, to use the computer to 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 solve the fluid problem. No matter it's related to the aircraft or to any kind of fluid problem, like life science, you have the blood or mm -hmm. other things. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's, uh, that's absolutely brilliant. Are there any other questions? Um, I don't see any in the chat function right now, but if you do have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Sorry, my computer is acting up a bit. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's absolutely brilliant that, um, of course, we have, um, we have, we have issues with the, um, the way blood circulation goes on, but I'm not sure that noise really is a, is a problem, but I'm sure that you can simulate other flow patterns, especially when it comes to, um, um, I mean, I, I'm particularly interested in that because it's uh, it's my field of research. So yeah, looking forward to hearing more about that in the future. Um, I, sorry, I believe Henriette has a question. Henriette, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, it's a follow on question from what you were saying, Jungnan. Thanks yeah. for the talk. That was really nice and interesting. Um, but yeah, so if you would, you know, start looking at other types of fluids like blood, yeah. what would be the kind of applications or what would be the kind of thing that you'd be looking at? Mm, there's, yeah, <clears throat> um, I think there's many, many health problems caused by the blood, like the, the like heart attacks, something. Right, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. When, when people get older, the, the, the vessel get narrowed. And right. Actually, the fluids cause some problem of the heart. So, <clears throat> by understanding that kind kind of bio, biological fluid problem, we can reduce the risk of like heart disease. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, we have a question from uh, JCB78. Would you like to unmute yourself and uh, ask the question yourself? Yes, hi, um, uh, it's, uh, Jackie Brayla here, I'm a, um, a veterinary surgeon. How do you see this transition from the computer simulation, which clearly what you're doing, to solving real life um, problems connected with turbulence? How, because you, you're, very much lab based. So how do you see the transition moving through into a practical solution? Yeah, so um, the computer first used to simulate fluids is mainly for the weather broadcast. And that time is we, we simulate the flow with many models built into it, which it, because the model was built from some empirical understandings of the flow. So as the computing power begins to increase dramatically and uh, we are able to simulate many fluid behaviors from first principle, that means we gradually reduce the empirical components in the model. And uh, now it's kind of, we can simulate large problems with less and less models built into it. And uh, that make us to understanding some, 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 to make some better understanding of the flow, flow problem and uh, try to use that understandings to to make better use of the flow. Right, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So it, you're, you're 
basically trying to formulate the questions to allow yeah i yeah. see yeah um any other questions at all um i don't see any others but um so anyway, in the interest of time, we're going to thank Zhang Nan. Thank you for an absolutely wonderful presentation. And uh, congratulations again, and good luck with everything you do <laughs> in the you. future. And uh, all right, shall, I, uh, shall we move on to uh, a bit of poetry, not from fluid dynamics, but um, real life poetry, I guess, <laughs> written by our very own Dr. Mary Murphy. Um, Mary, would you like to turn on your video? Um, while she is doing that, um, let me go ahead and uh, get started on the um, on her introduction. So Mary, like uh, Zhang Nan, joined us last year um, as a, uh, a PDRA uh, with uh, Lucy Cavendish and uh, has been, uh, let's see, she has corrected me on something that I just said wrong. <laughs> uh, she joined us last year and has been, a, um, has been a very important part of our PDRA group at uh, Lucy Cavendish this last year. And uh, by trade, she is actually uh, uh, a very, uh, she's very involved in uh, the educational aspects of uh, environmental, environmental awareness and uh, sustainability and this is quite obvious from her uh, quite extensive career that I've uh, I've just had the opportunity to acquaint myself with um, through her CV uh, so she's been she's done a lot of work um, in the sort of communication sector especially uh, with regards to uh, as I said um, environmental aver awareness and so on um, being an educator and also a creator and uh, producer in a radio broadcast in uh, South Africa um, and uh, she's also uh, been the founder and uh, owner of a uh, of a company that sells environmental solutions uh, for a wide range of clients called Full Cycle. Um, she, uh, since this, this was until about 2018, since then she has uh, obtained her PhD um, in the, uh, from the University of Rhodes in South Africa. And that was back in April, 2019. And since then she has been involved with the University of Cambridge and quite a few uh, projects that include uh, EdTech Hub and also another project that was uh, with the, um, in collaboration with the MRC Epi Epidemiological Unit. Her current project is, uh, is actually uh, very interesting. It's called the CW2GC uh, or Connecting Water to global citizenship via education for sustainable development. And this is with the Faculty of Education in the University of Cambridge. And uh, really sort of summarized into one word, she calls it hydrosociology. And this is what she's currently working on um, uh, here at uh, Cambridge. And hopefully when we all get back to our regular meetings in person, she will uh, enlighten us more about her current uh, research. But today she is going to address us in her capacity as a published author. She has uh, compiled um, a um, story poem called, Dye called Dying of Love, Voices of the Unrequited. And uh, that is what she's going to be uh, reading to us today. So if you've got a glass of wine handy, please feel free to uh, to grab that and uh, enjoy a bit of poetry. Uh, thank you, Mary. Would you like to uh, take the stage? A friend once said, if someone loves you and they do not love you back, then it is not love. It seems such an obvious thing to say. You can hear the pitter patter of give and take, the perfect balance of the yin and the yang, the ebb and flow, the logic and clarity that draws you in. I want to tell you a story about someone who completely lost their balance in love, where love wasn't a two-way street, but a dark, long, linear path to hell. Last winter, I went in search of a Guinness or two, 
while staying in a small town in the Wicklow Mountains. A little but well-established pub, Lizzie Kills, was recommended to me. When I walked in, it felt like I'd taken an Elysian step in from the cold paving to the warmth and welcome of the bar. I took position as far away from a busy group of four, but close enough that the bartender was in clear line of sight. I was aware of a loner lingering close by. As I sat patiently watching my Guinness settle, I could sense the loner moving closer. He tried many times to break into my internal conversation, and I signaled many times through my steadfast focus on my pints that I wasn't interested in engagement. It was only when he handed me a photograph pulled from the inside pocket of his double-breasted suit that my interest peaked. Buffered from sufficient Guinness, I took the photo and studied it closely. Taken in 1965 on Trafalgar Square, it showed a tall man towering and leaning over a pretty and petite woman dressed in a red skirt and white blouse. She was standing short and straight. They looked strong, in love, and not at all bothered by the hundreds of flapping pigeons that surrounded them. This was a photograph of Padder, the man in the bar, at the beginning of his relationship with the woman he had fallen completely and utterly in love with. He thought his love was returned, and so it seemed. They had two children together, but not long into their relationship, she fell in love with another and dumped him in that permanent, land-filled kind of way. But he continued his dogged insistence in loving her despite her scorn and contempt for him. He loved her even more as she drifted away. 51 years later, his heart is still in bits, broken into smithereens, his description of the state of his four hollowed chambers. And he carries each piece around with him. She not only rejected him, but chose to love his best friend. Or was it a choice? And did he choose to imprison him, himself in a world barren of love? At 72, Padder was pitifully angry and bitter. No doubt a bitterness that would deepen and grow, releasing him only at death. And even then that bitterness was likely to be set in stone. He warned me before he left, that I would think about his story. He was right, I did, I have. Not just because of his particular version, but because of its broader theme, unrequited love. It is an ever present theme in poetry and prose and a constant partner in the condition of love. So if my friend was right and unreturned love should not, could not be considered love, then why is it that so many people like Padder feel the anguish, the pain, the obsession, the jealousy, the bitterness, the loneliness, silence, despair, and desperation of unrequited love? So much that many feel they are literally dying from it, and in some cases actually do. Maybe part of the reason is that the seat of love is in the reptilian brain, the one way below more of our evolved gray matter the same part that regulates hunger, thirst, and the fight flight responses, the basic drivers of all species. The look and curse of our human species is that we get to write poetry about it. We get to express what we could not, would not otherwise say. Poetry does bring comfort and escape from the pain, the pain of unrequited love. There are many examples of unrequited couplings. Let's take Sinatra and Gardner. Old Blue Eyes begged Ava over and over again in song to take, Oh, love me, why not take, oh, love me. Then there's Yeats and Maud gone. So besotted was Yeats that after repeated and numerous rejections, he proposed to Maud's daughter when she turned 21, anything to have just a piece of his object of desire. I can't help wonder through Maud's perspective what she thought of his obsession. They met at the Yates family apartment in London. The story goes Maud walked in to join them for afternoon tea and from that moment on Yates was consumed by a lifelong love for her. She was probably thinking what the feck I just wanted a cup of tea. 
And then there's Hemingway and Marlena Dietrich. Hemingway believed the relationship had never been consummated because they were, quote, victims of unsynchronized passion. Those times when I was out of love, the crowd was deep in some romantic tribulation. And on those occasions when Dietrich was on the surface and swimming about with those marvelously seeking eyes, I was submerged. Apart from poor timing, there is also an undercurrent of depression, which frequently grabbed Hemingway, threatening to submerge him with it. In one letter to Dietrich in 1950, he touches on his perception of their shared inner turmoil. Toi and moi have lived through about as bad times as ever there were. I don't mean just wars. Wars are spinach. Life in general is the tough part. Depression and despair are common afflictions of the unrequited. I don't think there is another poet who quite captures the melancholy and pain of love the way Ingrid Junker does. In her poem, We, Andre Brink, for whom the poem was written, says that Ingrid saw in the beginning of a new love that which already presages its end. We, for Andre. In this way, you will die off from me, like your futile seed, naked like water, a burning shimmer, like late April, like hands naked, lovely as mortality, as a final word, sad as blood, no little one, only this little death, tomorrow the burning shimmer of our unbegotten seed, tomorrow dawn the blossoms, new girls like virgins, tomorrow you die and I. So as she says in her poem, Love Has No Right, I too have no right to imagine or interpret what she meant, but I can't help wondering, was the source of her unreturned love the world itself? As can be heard in Wind Song or Man, Old Man Travelling, or in these last three verses from Little Grain of Sand. Little world, round and earth blue, make a mere eye out of you. House with a door and two slits, a garden where everything fits. Small arrow feathered into space, love fades away from its place. Carpenter seals a coffin that's bought. I ready myself for naught. Small grain of sand is my word, my breath. Small grain of naught is my death. And then there's Scarlet O'Hara. There are also bouts of blindness that afflict the unrequited born out of a dogged denial of what's in front, a refusal to accept the object of desire is something or someone other than the lover wishes them to be. A figment of the imagination. Just like Scarlett's love for Ashley in Gone with the Wind, when she finally realizes, or at least admits, I loved something I made up, something that's just as dead as Melly is. I made a pretty suit out of clothes and fell in love with it. And when Ashley came riding along, so handsome, so different, I put that suit on him and made him wear it, whether it fitted him or not. And I wouldn't see what he really was. I kept on loving the pretty clothes and not him at all. Obsessions can lead to addictions, as in Jeffrey Eugenie's fictional character, Mitchell from The Marriage Plot. He remained heartbroken, which meant one of two things. Either his love was pure and true and earth-shakingly significant, or he was addicted to feeling forlorn. He liked being heartbroken. There is something about the big, fat, mucky puddle that we sometimes wallow in way too long. By the time we emerge, we are caked and all dried up. We linger so long we can't hear the calls of those who care about us to come out and play. We would rather hold tight to love, even if a source of misery in a cocoon of silence. For it's likely if we share it, there'll be a friend around, like mine, who will tell us to get up and move on. According to John Burnside, to be in love and to say nothing about it seems the most elegant and perhaps the only sensible form of romantic attachment. It's a sentiment poetry and music only occasionally address. Walter Raleigh's The Silent Lover keeps its own counsel beautifully and eloquently. The Silent Lover. Passions are likened best to floods and streams, the shallow murmur, but the deep are dumb. So when affections yield discourse, it seems, the bottom is but shallow whence they come. 
they that are rich in words and words discover that they are poor in that which makes a lover. Wrong not, sweet empress of my heart, the merit of true passion with thinking that he feels no smart that sues for no compassion. Since if my plain serve not to approve the conquest of thy beauty, it comes not from defective love, but from excess of duty. For knowing that I sue to serve a saint of such perfection as all desire but one none deserve a place in her affection. I rather choose to want relief than venture the revealing, where glory recommends the grief, despair distrusts the healing. Thus those desires that aim too high for any mortal lover, when reason cannot make them die, discretion doth them cover. Yet when discretion doth bereave the plaints that they should utter, then thy discretion may perceive that silence is a suitor. Silence and love be raised more woe than words, though ne'er so witty. A beggar that is dumb, you know, may challenge double pity. Then wrong not, dearest, to my heart, my true, though secret passion. He smarted most that hides his smart and sues for no compassion. Sometimes, as Margaret Drabel points out, the best love poems are written by the most faithless lovers like Burns and Byron. Byron seemed to fall in love at the drop of a hat as he did with the young man at Mussolini who looked after him in illness and to whom the following is dedicated. Love and Death by Lord Byron. I watched thee when the foe was at our side, ready to strike at him or thee and me. Were safety hopeless rather than divide, aught with one loved save love and liberty. I watched thee on the breakers when the rock received our prow, and all was storm and fear, and bade thee cling to me through every shock. This arm would th be thy bark of breast thy bier. I watched thee when the fever glazed thine eyes, yielding my couch and stretched me on the ground, when overworn with watching ne'er to rise from thence if thou an early grave hadst found. The earthquake came and rocked the quivering wall, and men and nature reeled as if with wine. Whom did I seek around the tottering hall for thee, whose safety first provide for thine? And when convulsive throes denied my breath, the faintest utterance to my fading thought, to thee, to thee, e'en in the gasp of death, my spirit turned, O oh, oftener than it ought. Thus much and more, and yet thou lovest me. Not, I blame thee, though it be my love. Lot. So Byron would probably agree with Patter and say that we have no who we love without rhyme or reason to stay away from, which of course we ignore. Those our friends try to get us to run from. We find ourselves simply falling in extricably, hopelessly and despairingly in love. We even recognize the folly as we madly grip and grasp at anything that would stop the fall, but we fall anyway. But sometimes, just sometimes, rhyme and reason strike a balance and find the perfect place to thrive and only death stops the lover from reaching her beloved. But even death does not end the love. In Lady Catherine Dyer's epitaph to her husband, she wrote this, in 1641. My dearest dust, could not thy hasty day afford thy drowsy patience leave to stay one hour longer, so that we might either sit up or gone to bed together. But since thy finished labor hath possessed thy weary limbs with early rest, enjoy it sweetly, and thy widow bride shall soon repose her by thy slumbering side, whose business now is only to prepare my nightly dress and call to prayer. 
Mine eyes wax heavy and the days grows old. The dew falls thick, my blood grows cold. Draw, draw the closed curtains and make room. My dear, my dearest dust, I come, I come. There's also the quietness and gentleness of the unrequited love, beautifully displayed in Harold Pinter's poem, It Is Here. What sound was that? I turn away into the shaking room. What was that sound that came in on the dark? What is this maze of light it leaves us in? What is the stance we take? To turn away and then turn back? What did we hear? It was the breath we took when we first met. Listen, it is here. The gentleness and fragility of love, I think, is superbly reflected in this, one of my favorite E.E. E. Cummings poems. Somewhere I have never traveled gladly beyond any experience. Your eyes have their silence. In your most frail gesture are things which enclose me or which I cannot touch because they are too near. Your slightest look easily will unclose me. Though I have closed myself as fingers, you open always petal by petal, myself a spring opens, touching skillfully, mysteriously, her first rose. Or if your wish be to close me, I and my life will shut very beautifully, suddenly, as when the heart of this flower imagines the snow carefully everywhere descending. Nothing which we are to perceive in this world equals the power of your intense fragility, whose texture compels me with the color of its countries, rendering death and forever with each breathing. I do not know what it is about you that closes and opens. Only something in me understands. The voice of your eyes is deeper than all roses. Nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. Sometimes unrequited love cries out, seeking mercy in the endless circle the lover is caught in, as in this untitled anonymous poem written somewhere before 1530. Western wind, when wilt thou blow the small rain down can rain? Christ, if my love were in my arms and I in my bed again. And then when they get the object of their desire, the lover tries to completely consume the object of their love. When the beloved becomes incorporated as in Tennyson's infamous poem, now sleep the crimson petal, now the white. Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white. Nor waves the cypress in the palace walk, nor winks the gold fin in the porphyry font. The firefly wakens, waken thou with me. Now droops the milk white peacock like a ghost, and like a ghost she glimmers on to me. Now lies the earth all danae to the stars, and all thy heart lies open on to me. Now slides the silent meteor on and leaves a shining furrow as thy thoughts in me. Now folds the lily all her sweetness up and slips into the bosom of the lake. So fold thyself, my dearest, thou, and slip into my bosom and be lost in me. Dorothy Parker. But of course, there's the sheer wit and humor of the unrequited love. None more equipped to sharpen a tail than Dorothy Parker. Dorothy's few unsatisfying affairs left her longing and caught in a cycle of destruction and repeated attempts at suicide. But she had great humor and wit to offset the grit. Some of her well-known quips. The first thing I do in the morning is brush my teeth and sharpen my tongue. Tell him I'm too fucking busy or vice versa. Do not look at me in that tone of voice. She also had a couple of warnings to women in the poem Unfortunate Coincidence, for example. By the time you swear your he's shivering and sighing and he vows his passion is infinite, undying. Lady, make a note of this. One of you 
is lying. Or two volume novel, the sun's gone damn dim and the moon's turned black for I loved him and he didn't love back. I think Dorothy got whacked by her own cynicism. I'm so grateful to her for leaving some of her words behind so I can find comfort when I need them, as in little words. When you are gone, there is nor bloom, nor leaf, nor singing sea at night, nor silver birds, and I can only stare and shape my grief in little words. I cannot conjure loveliness to drown the bitter woe that racks my cords apart. The weary pen that sets my sorrow down feeds at my heart. There is no mercy in the shifting year. No beauty wraps me tenderly about. I turn to the little words so you, my dear, can spell them out. A new love poem in the world is a good thing. This one I like because it deals in the longings and slippages of the prize of love. It's called Echo by Carol Ann Duffy. I think I was searching for treasures or stones in the clearest of pools when your face, when your face, like the moon in a well where I might wish, might well wish for the iced fire of your kiss only on water my lips where your face, where your face was reflected lovely not really there when I turned to look behind at the emptying air, the emptying air. But the real heart of the unrequited affliction is the indomitable optimism, which lies, I believe, at the heart of all our romantic yearnings. If I had a spangled banner, I'd cast it toward the skies and lasso down a gold star to lay before your side, and we would age together in a perfect, endless kiss, forever and forever in the sunset's golden bliss. In the jungles of Guatemala, there is a temple to the grandest sun king of the grandest city-state of the greatest civilizations of the Americas, the Mayans. Kata Kinchawi stood six feet tall and lived into his 80s. He was buried under his temple in 728 AD. Mayan inscriptions tell he was deeply in love with his wife, so he built a temple for her opposite his. Every spring and autumn, exactly at the equinox, the sun rises behind his temple and bathes hers in the shadow. And in the evening, as the sun sets, the shadow of hers perfectly bathes his. For over 1,300 years, these two lovers still touch and kiss from their tombs. It's this optimism and deep yearning that keeps the fires of love burning, as Lady Dyer or the Mayan king demonstrate. But the fires of love can also smother us up in darkness that ravages the flames, as it did with Padder, whose love was destroyed in the bitter embers of hope. Poor Padder, it's like Charles Schultz's illustrious character Peanuts warns. Nothing takes the taste out of peanut butter quite like unrequited love. Thank you, Mary. That was absolutely lovely. <laughs> Um, please feel free to clap in the, um, in the chat function <laughs> that definitely deserves a, um, a very long round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, that being said, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. That was, uh, an absolutely wonderful session by our postdocs. Um, I hope to, uh, I hope you will all join us again next week. Uh, same time, um, June 17th, Wednesday for uh, a talk by our uh, senior tutor and uh, resident virologist. And uh, that should be very relatable indeed, uh, just as much as unrequited love, I guess. <laughs> Thank you again and uh, have a lovely evening.